Hello everyone and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Bryn Montirith and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs such as this and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by e emailing dolesab at ku.edu or speaking with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off all cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Senior Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you very much and good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. Uh, tonight's interview will be conducted by the Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey and is co-sponsored by the Kansas Public Radio and local Lawrence Downtown Business Sunflower Outdoor and Bike. Following the conversation, we'll host a book sale and signing so you can secure a copy of Michael Cornish. The World's Fastest Man, The Extraordinary Life of Cyclist, Major Taylor, America's First Black Sports Hero. If you can't tell, I am really excited about this. I know my mom and dad would not believe that this would be someone you're talking about from the 1800s. Tonight, we are honored to host author Michael Cranish for the fourth program, our ongoing series, A Conversation on Race. We have had three before, and if you haven't seen it, please take the opportunity to go to our gallery and watch them. Michael Cranish is an investigative political reporter for the Washington Post, and has written and co-authored a variety of books, including The Real Romney, John F. Curry, The Complete Biography, and Trump Revealed. Tonight, we'll hear more about his impactful book, the world's fastest man, detailing the life, the tribulations, and the career of Major Taylor, the first African-born black world champion in any sport. Please join me in welcoming Michael Cranish. Thank you, Barbara. I'm not sure, is my mic on? Oh, you can hear me. I, I'm not sure that uh, what we were doing with the lights, but it is close to Halloween, so 
So stand by for a little special fun maybe after the program is over. Michael, thanks so much for coming to the Dole Institute. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Let's start out with a little bit of personal info about you and then get into who Major Taylor was. Tell us about your upbringing and education. Wow, okay, well, I was born um, right outside Washington, D.C. Um, my father was a reporter for a wire service, so I grew up hearing about the news in Washington, so I really was my daily dinner conversation. Um, it was a rare day when we didn't talk about what was going on in Washington and in the world, so that obviously would have had a great impact on me. Um, my parents did not believe in giving allowance. Instead, all of us kids, there were three boys and one girl, we, were, we carried the newspaper. So I delivered the Washington Post as a kid. So I say to people, my first job, you know, regular job was with the Post, and presumably my last job will be with the Washington Post. So it's come full circle. Um, they pay a little better than they did as a paper boy, I can assure you of that. Uh, and um, so I, if you'd asked me what I wanted to do when I was 13, it's probably what I'm doing today. Wanted to work for the Post, wanted to do investigative reporting. I really had it in my mind <clears throat> that I did not want to stay in Washington to start my career. I wanted to spend most of my career there. But for whatever reason, I really had the idea that it would be important to be outside of Washington for the first five, 10 years of my career. So I purposefully, after going to Syracuse University, getting degrees in journalism, political science, I purposefully uh, left uh, Washington and did reporting um, initially in Florida for five years, a small paper called the Lakeland Ledger, um, which was owned by the New York Times, so that was attractive to me, and then the Miami Herald. Um, and then I got an offer to move to the Boston Globe. Um, my brother lived outside of Boston, so I was visiting him, so I stopped by the Globe and told them I was interested in working for them, and things worked out that they sent me to their bureau in New Hampshire. And the reason that was attractive to me was that I always had wanted to cover the New Hampshire primary. This was a little different, because I was supposed to cover everything going on in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine in this job. But when I got there, the, the primary was just underway. This, that happened to be the quadrennial primary season. So my first two months at the Globe, suddenly I was thrown in covering um, presidential campaigns, which was incredibly great fun. And because we were the Boston Globe, with the largest circulation in New Hampshire, suddenly um, you know, it was very important for candidates to talk to me. So I felt very excited that I'd be starting my career in that way and covering politics. Previous to that, I covered almost everything, city hall, urban um, development, courts, everything you could possibly do, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to get a sense of what it was like to be a well-rounded reporter, thinking one day <clears throat> maybe I'd be a congressional reporter or White House reporter, but I wanted to do it at the local level first. So um, that's a very long way of saying I got to the Boston Globe, spent a long time there. Most of it was in the Washington Bureau. Um, and while I was there, that's how I got to know you. So um, I just want to thank you for all that you did back then. Um, I know we had many conversations um, during campaigns, during various things going on in the Senate. I covered uh, Bob Dole um, when he was the leader in the Senate and learned an awful lot uh, covering him. Um, and as I was saying in our conversation prior to this, that a lot of what I covered then really affects the way I see politics today, the way he did uh, politics. We could talk all night about Bob Dole, we're gonna talk about Major Taylor, but I just wanna thank you, uh, thank Barbara for the nice introduction, thank the um, Institute and the friends for having me here so we can talk about a subject which also in some ways is political, and we'll explain why as we go on, why this story of a bicycle racer in the 1890s in some ways is a great social political story as well, which is why I wanted to write about it. Well, and that was exactly my next question. Why did you write the book? And how did you research it? Because, you know, there isn't a lot out there other than, I think, an autobiography on Major Taylor. Well, um, I'm a cyclist. I've never raced, um, but I have been cycling since I was probably seven years old in one form or another. So I have an interest in cycling, but I had really no interest in writing a book about a cyclist. Um, I, I'm interested in history. Um, I had done a couple of other books before this, so I had already had some experience writing. Um, essentially what happened was I heard that there was a Massachusetts African-American cyclist who had become a world champion at the time of the Jim Crow laws. And I just thought, how, how did I not hear of this person who was at his height 50 years before Jackie Robinson? So to put it in perspective, um, people probably are familiar with the story of Jackie Robinson, Jesse Owens, many others, 
Uh, Jack Johnson was the first heavyweight world champion African-American, and that was in 1908. And in doing the research for this book, um, I came across uh, some writing by Jack Johnson. He actually started his career as a cyclist, which I had not known. I'd seen movies about Jack Johnson, and he was cycling um, in Texas, where he was from, and he was in a horrific uh, accident. He was in the hospital for a long time. And cycling, we'll get into this, was a very dangerous sport at that time where they would go around a curved, banked, um, oval, velodrome type of racing, and there were many people who were killed. So Jack Johnson uh, later said that after that accident, after being hospitalized, he wanted to be in a safer sport, so he became a boxer. <laughs> and that, that just puts in perspective, he was modeling himself initially after Major Taylor, who was Major Taylor, and I just got very interested in this little known story, um, and I just became obsessed, as happens with writers, um, uh, with this subject. And uh, very long story short, um, because I was working for the Boston Globe, I thought there might be a magazine story um, in Major Taylor's story. We'd never written a story at the Globe from the archives about him, except during his days of cycling, we wrote lots of stories about him. In fact, I later learned he was one of the most chronicled African Americans of his day because he was, became so famous. So I pitched the idea um, to someone who didn't think it was a great idea to write about. That person left, I pitched it to someone else who said, that's the perfect story for the Sunday Boston Globe magazine. So um, I tracked down the great granddaughter of Major Taylor. I learned that the, that the daughter of Major Taylor, his only child, was still living at that time, and she was 96 years old. So I immediately, the first thing you do when you're writing something like this is you find the oldest person first. So I found she was in a facility, um, very much um, had all of her faculties. She was living at an um, assisted facility of some kind in Pittsburgh, and I went to see her and talk with her, had a great conversation with her and her memories of her father. She had given all of her father's papers to an Indiana museum where his, her father had been raised. Um, and so that sort of got me going, and I wrote that in 2001, and then I just kept going, and this book came out in 2019. So that is an obsession, to be sure, that you start out really in the late 1990s and then you end up, two decades later, um, you know, ending up writing the book. Okay, um, I wanna, I'm gonna ask a really general question because I, as I was looking at my questions, I realized that I was gonna jump into people and issues about Major Taylor, but let's just start with a really basic question. Who was Major Taylor and, and you know, what was, so exciting about him? Well, Major Taylor um, grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. His parents had been in Kentucky. Um, his father, and I did research on this that was unique to this book, his father had served in the Civil War for the North, which I knew, but I'd read all sorts of things about Major Taylor and no one could figure out how his father had served. Very long story, I did so much research because I was obsessed with saying, I'm an investigative reporter, I should be the one to figure this out. Um, and I found out that his father had served in the Civil War for the North under a different name, which sometimes happens. Sometimes you took the name, if you had been a slave, I don't know if he was a slave, but you might have taken the name of a slaveholder's family, or someone may have paid for you to go in their place. But Major Taylor, late in his life, wrote a letter to his wife, um, and he said, if something happens to me and I get killed in an accident racing, here's all the information about life insurance and pensions. And he said, oh, and by the way, my father's pension is under a different name called Wilhite because such and such. And I went, oh my God, there's the answer. And I then used that name to find records to figure out that his father not only served in the Civil War for the North, but was there at the fall of Richmond. Uh, so it was really quite extraordinary. You can imagine you know, the impact that would have had on the family. He came back after serving in Kentucky. They moved to Indiana, Indianapolis, um, and Major Taylor was born in Indianapolis and was sort of taken in by a very wealthy family who had a young boy, Major Taylor's age, um, who um, liked to ride a bicycle, and they became great pals. This friend was white, his father was very wealthy, Major Taylor obviously was an African American, and they became great friends. And Major Taylor later said it was like being a millionaire son. He had an experienced prejudice, he had everything available to him that a, a young boy might want at that time, and he started um, becoming so good at the bicycle, he would do bicycle tricks. He would stand on the saddle, he would dismount over the handlebars, and a bicycle shop owner saw him doing this and said, come to my store, I'd like you to, to advertise for my store, and you can do tricks in front of my store, it'll attract customers. 
um, to my store, and he was wearing some kind of a military-looking jacket. My guess is that it was his father's Civil War jacket, but it could have been livery clothing, could have been something else to make him look distinctive. And from ever that time, very young boy, he was known as Major Taylor. And the bike shop owner became very affectionate about him, started um, providing him with bikes, putting him in local races, and very quickly realized this young boy was an incredibly fast racer. Um, and this went on. We could talk about just his early days for quite a while. But as he grew up in Indianapolis, he became such a great racer that he would win all these races. And he actually almost beat an unofficial world record. And people began to realize that this was an extraordinary athlete uh, in their midst. But because of the racism at the time, he couldn't do an awful lot of what he might have been capable of. He wanted to train with his white friends at the YMCA. Um, and when he went there to join his friends, they turned him away. They said, we don't take blacks at the YMCA in Indianapolis. So he said, this was the first time uh, in my life that I faced what he called the monster prejudice. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll get into that in a lot deeper at the end of the interview. But talk to us a little, because I, I suspect there are some cyclists in the crowd tonight. Talk to us a little bit about Major Taylor's training program and how, um, you know, how tough it was. Well, if you can picture Major Taylor, he's he, at, his, at his height, at his greatest height, he was five foot seven. He was about 143 if he was at his good racing weight. He was a little bit heavier in some years. But he was not a large man who would be a typical sprinter. And what he was doing in this era um, would have been participating in shorter races, which you particularly needed someone who was typically might be taller, stronger. And if you look at the early pictures of him, he looks like a very small um, racer. And the pictures of him you see with other racers, he's usually the shortest person there. Um, and he had met the, a world champion named Arthur Zimmerman. And Zimmerman wrote a book, one of the first training manuals, it was called Points on Training, about how to train to be a cyclist and what to eat and so forth. And Major Taylor really paid great attention to Arthur Zimmerman. He wanted to be he later said, the black Zimmerman. So he followed this to a T. At the time, there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge about, if you're an athlete, all the best things to do. And he followed the Zimmerman method, which meant intensive training. You didn't eat the starchy fats. He focused on protein. He would eat prodigious amount of eggs, for example, to get more protein. So um, he wanted to turn himself, he said, into the perfect, that was his word, perfect specimen. And if you look at pictures of him when he was young, and didn't look like he had mus musculature. And then when he's a little bit older, it is an amazing transformation. By the time he had developed this method based on Zimmerman's training program, he had to have been one of the fittest athletes in the world. It's an amazing, amazing transformation. He said later that if I was an ounce over or under my weight, that he would lose his competitive edge. He knew that given his stature, um, that he needed to be fitter, better trained than any other cyclist he was going against. Okay. Many of us have watched the Tour, uh, the Tour de France, or some of the one-day cycling classics, but how was cycling different? Of course, you're, we're talking about track cycling, but how was it different in, in you know, the previous centuries? Well, if you can put yourself, so the main events of this book start around 1896, when he becomes a professional racer. So in 1896, he's in New York City, and in the whole country, there are about 300 automobiles. And there are in the country about 5 million bicycles. Mm -hmm. And if you can picture New York City, there's just a very small number of autos. They didn't have brakes typically. They didn't go backwards. Um, basically, the city was covered with the horse and wagon. There were some elevated trains, but it was about eight years before the subway. So to get around, most people were going on the horse and buggy or the street level or elevated trains. And it was very noisy and smelly. And the entire city... Um, you know, just a single horse, and there were about 150,000 of them in New York City at this time were doing their various droppings across the city, and it was a hellish landscape to be part of. And as the bicycle came along, um, you know, in the earlier days, there were these high-wheeled bicycles, very difficult to race um, and to ride for the average person. Then they developed the bicycle they called the safety bicycle because it was today's bicycle with two equal-sized wheels. Um, and that enabled the average person to ride. So there were so many people riding to work um, in New York City in the 1890s, this was the, the height of the bicycle craze, that one person very lyrically described a stream of cyclists going home at night with their lanterns on the front of the bicycles 
is that it looked like a river of fire down the streets. There were so many bicyclists with their lanterns, you know, heading home um, over the bridges to the outer boroughs. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a time when bicycling was the most popular sport in the country, more popular than baseball or boxing. Mm. Um, bicycling was the center of the sporting world. It's hard for us to imagine today unless you think about how popular the Tour de France is in France today. And that's what cycling was at that time in this country. And it wasn't these long races like we know of today. It was, um, if you can imagine, you know, like the motorway that's down the highway, I-70, I uh, hear that I saw coming up today. If you can imagine that as a velodrome, and you can imagine the oval racing track uh, for the cyclists, and it's a banked, curved um, track that they can go up and they can go down. Um, and at that time, this is the fastest race people had seen. So it's before auto racing. So it's incredibly exciting. There was really nothing like it. And it would draw crowds easily of 10,000 people or more. So it was the main event. So everyone followed cycling if they were interested in sport. But it was, sadly, at that time, basically a white man's sport. There were very few people who were black who were able to race in races other than races that were for blacks. And at that time, um, it was a little imagined that blacks would compete against whites. Because at the main time I talk about in opening this book, 1896, and it really is a book about racial history and social justice. It's not a history just of cycling. I really was interested because of you know, the history involved here. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson had been decided by the Supreme Court. Um, and that, of course, was the infamous case in which a gentleman in Louisiana, Homer Plessy, had tried to board a first-class car. Um, and that car, uh, the uh, officers on the train said, was for whites only. And Homer Plessy said, no, I want to stay in that car. Um, and he was arrested. He, they said under the Separate Car Act, as the name suggests, that he was not allowed to be in that car. It went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided by 7 to 1 in 1896 that those accommodations of two separate cars was fair and that there was this principle of separate but equal. And it would not be till the 1954 decision in Board versus Brown of Education that Supreme Court finally overturned that 1896 decision. So you can imagine when I start these events for Major Taylor when he's racing professionally, it's six months after Plessy versus Ferguson. That's how that story begins. So there were a lot of people saying there should be no black person you know, racing against us. The Supreme Court basically had just institutionalized racism. They had institutionalized the Jim Crow laws. And that's when you see this incredible rise of Major Taylor. And that's why I was so attracted to telling his story. How did he do that? Well, what were the challenges he faced because of his race? Well, almost everything imaginable. Um, he had faced, as I mentioned, he couldn't go to the YMCA, um, which you think of all places would have been welcoming. Makes you sad to think that at that time they would have turned him away. He had a very important mentor, um, and I, who I write about a lot in this book, and this gentleman's name was Louis de Franklin Munger, and his nickname was Bertie, so everyone knew him as Bertie Munger. He had been the world's fastest man on a bicycle previous. He had been the champion in the era of the high wheel bicycles. So Bertie Munger had ended his racing career. He had moved to Indianapolis to build a bicycle factory because this was, as I mentioned, the sort of the height of the craze. Um, and there were some 250 factories across the country making bicycles. Indianapolis was one of the centers of this commerce. And he's the one who really helped uh, Major Taylor. He gave him the best bicycle possible. He took him to tracks and helped train him. And he had several cousins who were partners in his manufacturing company. And they basically said, we don't want you helping this black kid, Major Taylor. Um, and Bernie Munger, who had faced a lot of his own trials and tribulations himself that I write about in the book, uh, in the end decided, no, I'm going to stick by him. I'm going to take him to my new facility in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm going to leave Indianapolis. Um, I'm going to take him with me. And one day, I'll return to Indianapolis, and he's going to be the world champion. And incredibly, that's what happened. He took him to Worcester, um, Massachusetts. Um, he trained him more. And you know, it's up to one man, an individual. Cycling is a very individual sport. He didn't do team races for the most part. So it really wasn't the end up to Major Taylor to, to do this. But when Bertie Munger took him to Worcester, he took him almost, the first thing he did was took him to the YMCA in Worcester. And there the YMCA welcomed him to train. And it was there that he learned how to be 
you know, the great athlete that he became. He used all the methods, you know, that were available to him for training at that YMCA in Worcester, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. How did the shifting con contour of race relations in the early 20th century affect him and his career? Well, initially, a lot of white racers basically laughed him off. They didn't think they had, he had a chance. They believed the racist rhetoric of the day. At the time, there was what was called the eugenics movement, which essentially said that whites were superior to blacks. The blacks were inferior intellectually, athletically. So Major Taylor, it's not a story of you know, one athlete against another. He knew that he had to disprove the racist theories that surrounded eugenics, the racist theories that put all of his race down. So he knew he had so much riding on his shoulders, as did those who were his, his benefactors, his mentors and so forth. They knew that they were risking a lot. If he failed, people would just say, aha, this just proves you know, our racist notions. So it was an incredible risk. Um, he faced time and again uh, white riders saying, you know, you can't race with us. Um, they threatened him, they beat him, they choked him. Um, you know, it goes on and on. Um, but Major Taylor eventually was brought to New York City, as I mentioned, 1896 in December, six months after that Supreme Court case. And he goes to some promoters who are promoting the greatest race of the day, which was a six-day race at Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden at that time is not, of course, today's iteration, but it was at um, what is still called Madison Square Park. And it was this great palace, the greatest sporting arena in the country. And the idea of the six-day race is just as it sounds. You would go around the oval velodrome track for six days straight, and whoever had the most miles at the end was the winner. It was an inhumane contest. Major Taylor was 18 years old. There was no way this young man, who basically was very good at sprinting and shorter races, that he should have been involved in such a race. But it was the most prominent race, and Bertie Munger at that time was selling his, his brand in New York City, and he thought if Major Taylor was successful, everyone will know the, the Munger brand. So he bet everything, really, on Major Taylor and provided him with a Munger-built bicycle and wanted him to race in this race. But it took Major Taylor going to the promoters saying, I need a racing license. And at that time, racing licenses were not given to most um, black riders. And he went to the promoters and said, you know, I want to race in the six-day race. I, I can do this. I've won a lot of amateur races. And the two promoters, who were basically baseball people who made more of their money in cycling, since it was the bigger sport, said no. And one of them said to him, um, according to account at the time, that shouldn't you be shining the white gentleman's shoes on Fifth Avenue? Mm -hmm. And Major Taylor said, no, I should be given a chance to race like anybody else in this contest. And what eventually happened was, even at this time when cycling was so popular, it was getting harder to attract the crowds of 10, 15,000 people to a place like Madison Square Garden. And Major Taylor eventually convinced them that they could promote this race as black versus white, um, and that this would attract a lot of people, unfortunately for racist reasons, but that it would draw new attention to this. And they had some of the greatest racers from around the world competing. And in fact, um, you can see in some of the races that Major Taylor later raced in, they actually had pins and buttons that would show his face and the white writer's face, and it would say white versus black. So it became a promotional tool. Um, and what happened, I don't know if you want to get to this in a separate question, the story of what happened in that six-day race in Madison Square Garden really was the great defining event, you know, beginning his career. Go ahead and tell us. All story. right. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> They're ready. <laughs> So in 1896, you know, this, the stage is set. It's, this, it's the Jim Crow era at its height. Um, and cycling's the greatest sport. And all of New York really wanted to come out and see this, this great race. The spectators would come in, they'd leave. So you'd have 15,000 or so people, 10,000 standing, um, excuse me, 10,000 seated maybe, 5,000 maybe up standing. Um, and they'd go in and out during all 24 hours of each of those six days. So they got many, many tens of thousands of people to see this race. It was covered, you can go back and look at the newspapers of the day, and there's just incredible massive coverage of this race. There's all these illustrations of Major Taylor um, at the race against the white competitors. And before they had the six-day race, they would have a half-mile sprint. So that was how it started. You, you compete in the half-mile sprint first, and then they'd have the six-day race. The greatest athlete in cycling of the day was a man named Eddie Bald. He was the picture that you would have of a 
great cycling champion. He was tall, he was white, he was a star. He was a superstar before that phrase was in our lexicon. He was on the cover of various advertising project, uh, products. He wanted to be a Broadway star, and he was the greatest sprinter in the world, and he was very well known. He was like a Hollywood matinee idol, and he was the one who was going to win this sprint. Everyone knew it, that that was going to happen. Very few people at that point had heard of Major Taylor, this 18-year-old who was entered by Bertie Munger, his mentor, in this sprint. So after a preliminary bout, Major Taylor and other racers, including Eddie Bald, were entered in this half-mile sprint, and they went around the track one time, two times, three times, four times, and by the fourth lap, Major Taylor was ahead. And since he hadn't really done this kind of thing in this venue before, it was very difficult, it was very smoky, it was very incredibly loud, it was so dirty, dusty, smoky, that he later said that he could have mistaken some of the other white riders for his brother. They were so <laughs> encased in the grime of Madison Square Garden. You could barely see around the curvature of the oval. So when he got to the fourth lap, he threw his hands up as if it was the victory, and his trainers on the side said, no, there's one more lap. And he immediately realized there was one more lap to go. Eddie Cannonballed, his nickname was Cannon because he could shoot from behind like a ball from a cannon. So this was the perfect moment, it seemed, for Eddie Bald to go from behind and win the race, as he'd done on so many occasions. But when Major Taylor realized this was his moment, he sped ahead like a cannon from a, like a cannonball from a cannon, and he won that race against Eddie Bald. So it was an incredible, incredible moment. And overnight, Major Taylor became a star. People were talking about him. Um, and for African Americans, you can imagine the impact this had. This was really an astonishing moment for a lot of people to read about in the African-American press, in the white press, um, that Major Taylor had beaten Eddie Bald 50 years before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. Major Taylor had paved the way. He then entered the six-day contest. Eddie Bald did not. Eddie Bald was a sprinter. He was no distance racer. He knew better than to enter this inhumane contest, which some writers will later say took years off their lives. Major Taylor had gotten the, the rider's license on the condition he raced six days. So he did, and it was incredibly difficult. And there were days he said he would hallucinate. Um, and he yelled out at one point, there's a man chasing him with a knife. And he would leave for an hour and get some rest and eat, and then he'd go back on and race some more. And in the end, he did come in an eighth place. But eighth place in your first six-day race against the best riders in the world on top of winning the sprint was an incredible accomplishment for an 18-year-old. So he really became the talk of the cycling world, the talk of the sporting press, and became a sort of a symbol of hope you know, for an awful lot of people. Um, and people got their news at this point you know, through different media. They, they, you know, this is before you have video and film and so forth. So you really um, you, know, you heard about him through the press, through the written press, for the most part. And as I say, he was one of the most chronicled African Americans of his day, because as he did his racing career throughout this country, abroad, um, throughout Europe, in Australia, he was written about in many thousands of stories, which of course were very helpful to me writing, writing this book. Mm -hmm. How did Major Taylor cope with these examples of racism that, that you've talked about and you write about in the book? Well, it was very difficult. There were time and again where he would say, you know, I'm going to quit, you know, this is incredibly unfair. Um, and there was one race in particular um, in Massachusetts where there was a, a white racer so mad that Major Taylor was allowed to participate that on the track he knocked Major Taylor down, he choked Major Taylor, and Major Taylor lay on that track for about five minutes unconscious. And Bertie Munger, his mentor, was at the track that day. He raced out to try to revive him. And there were even false rumors that um, Major Taylor had died, choked to death, on the track. He did survive, but it was another moment when he said to Bertie Munger, like, this is, this is crazy, they're, they're trying to kill me, um, and I quit. And he had a long talk with Bertie Munger, and he came up with an idea that was a terrible idea, but at that point, Major Taylor and Bertie Munger were so desperate that they went for it. There was a product which was really a racist product, sadly, that was advertised to blacks in African American magazines to lighten your skin. The message was that your skin is, is wrong and that you need to lighten it. So it was a very racist message. But at that time, 
they would market this to blacks as a way to improve their lives. And so um, at some point, Bertie Munger and Major Taylor agreed they would try to do this. And he allowed Bertie Munger, um, who he loved and who he dedicated his autobiography to, to apply this lotion to his skin. And this lotion was acidic. It burned his skin. It was incredibly painful. And um, Major Taylor later said you know, that it was one of the times he was scared to death. It was so painful. It didn't really lighten his skin. It just, it just hurt, and it just made him you know, really um, detest what was happening to him. And after a few days, you know, he'd agreed that they should do this. He said, no more. My race, the color of my skin, will be my fortune, and I'm going to race on behalf of my race, that I'm going to do this on behalf of blacks, that I'm going to basically make that my motto. And for Major Taylor, that was an epiphany. He knew this already, but it was really reinforced, as he later wrote, that this was, the, this was something that said to himself, like, I have so much riding on me, you know, I, I need to stand up for that. I need to stand up for everyone like me. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really compelling stories, Michael. Um, uh, you, you've talked a lot about Bertie Munger uh, tonight. Were there other examples of prominent uh, whites who assisted Major Taylor in his career? There were. Um, and in the book, I tried to portray it as Major Taylor saw it. You know, you don't want to get into what some people will refer to as, well, there's no, it's not a white savior story to do this, to be victorious. This was entirely on Major Taylor's shoulders. But at the time of the height of the Jim Crow era and all these incredibly terrible things happening, he did need people to help pave the way so he could shine on his own. So there were a number of people when he was banned from racing by a league, for example, a promoter came forward and said, I'll create a league that will have Major Taylor as a star. And he did that, and that helped Major Taylor. And then there were promoters from France where there wasn't the same kind of racism. And they came over to this country, and they visited Major Taylor at his home in Worcester, Massachusetts. And they pleaded with him. They saw what was happening to him with the racism here, and they said, come to France. It's the center of the cycling world. We want you to race against the best cyclists in France. We'll pay you $10,000, which was an incredible amount of money at that time, plus winnings. But they wanted him to race on Sundays, which was the typical day to race. Major Taylor was very religious. He promised his mother he would not race on Sundays. So he said, I want to do it. If you'll let me race on any day but Sunday, I'll be there. And for two years, this back and forth, they could use Bob Dole as a negotiator, back and forth <laughs> over would he race on Sundays, would they not? And finally, they agreed. They wanted him so badly. One promoter came over and told Major Taylor that you are the only racer in America that we could draw the kind of crowd we want in France. You're the only one. And so if that's the case, then don't make me race on Sundays. And they agreed. So they got Major Taylor to come over. He went over to France to race against uh, the greatest racer in France at that time, where he did not face the same kind of racism. There weren't many blacks living in, in Paris at that time when he was racing there. So he became an incredible sensation in France. And what a great pleasure it is to read the journals and newspapers um, from Paris of the day, where he's on the cover of the greatest magazines of the day. He's front page news. He's treated like the star that he should be. He's put up in the finest hotels. It's an alternate universe for Major Taylor, and it just reinforces to him how unfair the conditions were for him and everyone else who's black back in America. Mm -hmm. Near the end of his life, uh, Major Taylor met with Teddy Roosevelt. What was the significance of that to him personally and also to racial relations? Well, his father, Major Taylor's father, recalled um, that Major Taylor had two portraits outside of family portraits on the wall of his home. One was of Booker T. Washington, um, who we admired greatly, who had started university, um, African-American. Um, and there were people who were, um, felt different ways about Booker T. Washington versus W.E.B. Du Bois of the NAACP and who um, ran the Crisis magazine and so forth. Major Taylor was a great admirer of Booker T. Washington and also of Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt had invited Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House. Um, and that was something that made a great impression. Roosevelt had been the police commissioner in New York City when the 1896 race, the six-day race, occurred. So Major Taylor would have been aware of Theodore Roosevelt at the time. Maybe they had some interaction at that time. What I know for sure is that they later met. Major Taylor wrote his autobiography about you know, what an honor it had been to meet Major Taylor. And Roosevelt said, 
that he was always thrilled to meet someone who was at the pinnacle of whatever endeavor it was that they were trying to achieve. So, you know, it was a great honor. Major Taylor thought it was one of the great honors of his life. I can assure you when I write about it, Roosevelt did some things on race that weren't so great, um, but there were things that he did that Major Taylor admired um, in the context of the time. So um, it meant a lot to him um, that he had, he had met Roosevelt later on in life and what Roosevelt had said about him. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit, we, we've been talking about Major Taylor the racer. Talk about him a little bit as a person, about his personal life, and uh, about his condition when he passed. Well, Major Taylor, um, by virtue of the fact that he was getting these incredible earnings, he was earning more than the, the top baseball stars, more than Ty Cobb, the great baseball player. You know, he was the best paid, certainly African-American athlete of his day, and better paid than most white athletes. So he was able to do what a lot of African-Americans weren't able to do at that time. He wanted to have a home in Worcester. He was able through, there were restrictions. He knew a new home was being, uh, neighborhood was being built in Worcester that was being occupied by whites. He had someone else buy the home for him. He thought he should be allowed to live in this neighborhood, but he knew he'd probably be rejected if he just walked up to the real estate company. And so he had someone else buy the home and then he moved in, neighbors objected, and they wanted to pay him more than twice what he paid for the house so that he would not live next to them. And he refused. Why shouldn't I be able to live here? He could afford to take such a stand when most people couldn't. So he did many, many things to take a stand beyond you know, what was in racing. Um, as you skip ahead, you know, the book goes into great detail, you know, probably three-fourths of the book that we haven't discussed. Um, and you can read about the incredible exploits throughout France, the rest of Europe, two tours to Australia where he became a champion, and then coming back. What I found incredibly um, moving was that he retired, he started his own business, and I tell in great depth some of the story, or not that much great depth, but some of the stories of how he wanted to be a, basically a business titan, um, and that was more difficult, and there were some bad things that happened to him as he tried to become a um, executive in the tire world, which was Basically, with autos coming on, it was eclipsing bicycles and bicycle racing. So he tried to move on for that. Um, and in the end, he lost a lot of money unfairly in, in that venture. And in 1915, the movie Birth of a Nation was released, which led to the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and Major Taylor, in the mid-1920s, so I'm greatly skipping ahead here, he was at his home in Worcester, and he thought, people need to remember what happened you know, in my day, what happened with me. Uh, people need to know my story. And as he's in Worcester writing his autobiography, I went back and I was curious what was going on as I did. Throughout the book, I write about what's happening in the context of history at the time. And I went back and read the Worcester newspapers. And I found that at the very time he was writing his autobiography, the largest rally of the Ku Klux Klan ever held in New England was being held on um, fairgrounds a couple of miles from his house. In fact, the Klan, I didn't know the Klan had a plane. They had a, a plane that buzzed right around the neighborhood where Major Taylor lived. So I can only imagine, or I can't imagine really, how Major Taylor would have felt knowing after all he'd been through that there had been this rebirth of the Klan, rebirth of you know, just this incredible racism that was going on. And you have to wonder you know, what he thought. And so to him, it made it all the more important that he tell his story in an autobiography which he did. He based it on a lot of journals and clippings that he saved, which fortunately still exist that I was able to read. Um, but by the time it came out, it was the Great Depression. People had moved on from his era. They didn't really know about him. Um, and he comes to sort of a tragic end um, that I tell in the book. But it's important to remember that in his autobiography, in his writings, he said, and he knew at that time that things were more difficult, he wanted to be remembered as someone who inspired everyone, whether you were white or black or young or old, that if you put your heart into it, if you were determined that you could overcome the greatest odds. He wanted his message to be what he said. He said, I was a pioneer. <laughs> Take your time. And I had to blaze my own trail. That's what it did. Yep, and that's an understatement. Okay. Um, 
I have a couple more questions, then we'll be opening it up to audience questions, so be thinking about your questions. Um, you've mentioned, uh, Michael, both Jack Johnson and, and Jackie Robinson as being black athletes who brought down the racial barriers, um, but, but that was multiple years after Major Taylor. Why didn't he have that impact? I think he did. I think if we had, um, you know, lined up before us, this Jack Johnson, Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, that they would say they they knew about Major Taylor. Um, Major Taylor, when he died, was forgotten. He was buried in a pauper's grave in Chicago. Um, his obituary, after having been so greatly chronicled, there was one short story in an African American newspaper in Chicago and a brief mention elsewhere, but you find little of the adulation that he deserved. Um, and in, I think it was 1948, a number of great black athletes of the day, others, a member of the Schwinn Bicycle Company, they had his remains moved to a proper burial site with a proper memorial plaque saying, you know, what his accomplishments were that we've talked about here today. Um, so, you know, that's just around the time, a couple of years after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier and so forth around the same time. So there's no question in my mind that they would have known, you know, I mentioned that Jack Johnson emulated Major Taylor. Um, Jackie Robinson would certainly have known that story. Um, I wish we could, you know, that he was still here, that we could ask him that. Um, but, you know, they, unfortunately, racism just, racism just persisted. We had the Civil War, we had Reconstruction, and then there was a reaction to Reconstruction, and we had um, Jim Crow, and we had the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, it just goes on and on and on. And you know, a lot of people who read this tell me it was even worse than I thought. And then other people will say, it's even worse today than you understand. So we still have some of this going on today. So unfortunately, you need a series of pioneers to blaze trails. We still need pioneers to blaze trails um, in this country and all realms. So you know, it's sort of a never-ending story. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, one more question than your questions. Um, and uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. And if you're watching uh, online tonight, um, you can send questions if you have any to dolequestions at ku.edu. That's dolequestions at ku.edu. Michael, you've written about politics for your entire career. How did writing this biography differ from that? And how was it similar? Well, it differed in the sense that I could, I could take a stand. I would never do that in writing about a Bob Dole or anybody. If I'm writing about a current politician, I would tell the story, you know, not leave anything out, but I wouldn't say my opinion. In a book like this, writing history, um, you know, I can be, I don't have, I mean, everyone knows what happened. I don't have to beat around anything. So that's, that was freeing, you know, to be perfectly honest, having spent decades as a reporter where I, tr I really, really, really try hard to be as fair to both sides as possible. There's no other side to racism. You know, there's no other side to what happened to Major Taylor. Um, so I don't have to do that. Um, that, you know, there's just, there's no other way to tell the story but then to tell the story for what it was, to, to lay it all out there um, and to have that, that point of view. Um, in other ways, it was similar because you read about the, I, throughout this, if you read this book, it's sometimes on every page, I talk about what's going on in presidential politics or regional politics or you know, things like that. So you get, I always wanna know the context of the times. What's happening that day? How did this, not just, it's not a story of race or X beat race or Y, because I wouldn't be interested in that and I don't think anybody else would be unless you're incredibly nerdish on the topic of 1890s bicycle racing. It's a story of what was happening in the United States of America at that time through the eyes of this incredible individual who overcame you know, the worst incredible odds that you would have to face in the athletic realm. So um, I learned a lot about American history. I've written another book of history about Thomas Jefferson. It was sort of the same thing where I wondered, um, you know, I wanted to know more of the story about the founding of the country, and I wanted to tell it, you can, you know, we can talk about that on another occasion, but I wanted to understand history better, and I wanted to understand Jim Crow better, how racism developed in this country better, um, in that particular period, Jim Crow, the Gilded Age, so much is happening that shapes who we are today. We, have, we were founded with the original sin of slavery. We um, developed with this great conflict that we're still dealing with in many ways. So to me, it's a very relevant story. And I write 
you know, in the book various times that there are places in the book that clearly have meaning to today. I don't have to hit you over the head with, like, pay attention to this section, it's important today. But if you read the book, you'll understand that, you know, I'm, there's points about today that clearly I'm making that are still highly relevant. You know, as it says on the National Archives, past is prologue. If we don't understand yesterday, how can we deal with tomorrow? So that's what history is. That's what we try to do um, in my day-to-day -day job. That, that's what I do. Sometimes you write about the day's news, and then you go on to the next day's news. And it's important to me, and I think important to the public, that we have both. What's going on today, understanding our history, putting both together. So um, I've sort of made that you know, part of my career. It's not something I set out to do when I was you know, a paper boy living in the Washington Post, um, thinking about writing a history. But it turned out that to understand today, you need to understand yesterday. OK, very good argument for history. Um, let's open up to Q&A. Who's got the mics tonight? It's Michael and Allie. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And one of the students with a mic will uh, bring the microphone to you. And please just ask one brief question. So. Any questions tonight? Okay, now nah, it took, took a few seconds, but we got three, so we got two more up here. Were there any uh, innovations or strategies that Major T uh, Taylor brought into play being at the top of the cycling world for a number of years? You know, you mentioned that his training seemed to be very optimal. Were, were any of these copied by other cyclists? Well, there are certainly other people who were trying to train as well as Major Taylor. I don't think that they were as effective. In the back of the book, I thought I was so impressed with Major Taylor's training and, and nutrition that I put an appendix in the book, Major Taylor's training and nutrition programs. I thought it's as relevant today in many ways as it was way back then. Um, but the it's a great question. The answer is yes. He developed some techniques, um, some mechanical things for his bike um, that you see brought on today. He, he did a version of an elongated, stretched out um, bicycle handlebar to give him a better um, rim resistance. That's now very common today. He developed a particular type um, that some people even today refer to as a Major Taylor type of method. Um, and there were a lot of other things that he did. There were also some um, cycling techniques. There would often be a group, of, when he was doing the track racing in the Velodrome, there would be three or four white racers who would try to pocket him, in other words, envelop him so he couldn't escape their little pocket of racers and to stop him from beating any of them, these racers would make a sort of compact, which was illegal, to stop him so one of those other racers could win the race. And he developed a very um, incredible technique at which enabled him to escape that pocket. And sometimes it meant he had to very slightly nudge someone, um, which was a very dangerous move. Um, he said later in his life that he knew 11 cyclists who were killed on the track um, because you know, they would be pushed aside or they would fall. It was incredibly dangerous. Um, but in order to escape this pocket, he said, I also had to protect this, perfect this move where I would very slightly get in a very low position. And if I needed to, ever so slightly touch someone to get out of that pocket because they were illegally trapping me. I didn't want to hurt them, but I had to get out of that pocket. So he was incredibly adept at doing that. He would. Um, before the race, look at the, um, and someone here who might be a cycling expert more so than I am, could give the, um, the right numbers, but he would look at the size of, you know, how the chain was fitted, you know, ar around the teeth of the, the wheels and so forth. Um, and he would adjust his um, chain setting so that he could go perhaps at a higher cadence. And so someone else would be going, you know, with wider chains, that means you could go farther with less numbers of revolutions, but he could spin faster than someone else. And so if he thought a cyclist was better than him in a certain way, he would adjust his strategy accordingly. Um, and he was very effective at that. So he was very strategic. Every race, he knew the racers, he knew how they raced, he knew the size of their, their bikes, um, he knew the size that they would run their, their chains around to give him perhaps just a little bit extra benefit. It was all part of the psychology and his strategy of racing. Okay, next question right here. When he would race at Madison Square Garden, were blacks allowed to be spectators? Did they have a segregated area? Were they there? 
Uh, as far as I know, um, they were allowed to be there and that they did not have a segregated area. I don't know if there was some de facto segregated area or not, but I did not come across a reference to that in that particular venue. There were other venues where blacks were not allowed. Um, unfortunately, a lot of venues in the South did not allow them to race, and there were also a number of venues in the North um, that also didn't allow them to race. And it was all down to, do you have a racing license? Are you sanctioned by this league? They would do whatever they could. So I'm sure there were many places that, just as there were separate facilities for blacks on trains and everything else, that they would have done that. But I don't know um, that that was the case. I don't have any evidence that was the case, or would have been the case um, in New York City at that time. Okay. Seems like somebody else had a quest had a hand up over here. Okay, and then we have one right here. Uh, could you say a couple of words about the influence of his wife in his, his participation to his life? So the question was about his wife, whose name was Daisy. Um, she was an extraordinary woman. Um, they met um, at a church social in Worcester, Massachusetts. Both of them were quite religious. She was an extraordinary athlete in her own right. This was not a time that a woman could accomplish what a woman today may accomplish in sports, um, even though there's much yet to be done in that realm, too, as far as equality. Um, but she, she was very important in a number of ways. Um, they got married, and it would seem like they were going to go together to Paris at the last moment. Um, it was decided that it would be too difficult for her, um, and so he went alone the first time. Later, they went together. Um, they had one child. They, she went with him on this incredible journey to Australia. And I think this was around, I think it was 1901 or 02. Um, very few Americans were taking ships all the way to Australia, much less African Americans. Um, and he was invited there to compete um, in races in Australia. Um, Daisy went, and I think there were two occasions, two tours, and I think she was on both, if I recall correctly. Some of this research I did some years ago, so if I misstate some technical detail, please forgive me. But on one of those trips, um, she became pregnant, um, and she had a child, and that child's name was Sydney, after the city that they had stayed um, <laughs> in Australia. And that's the woman who I ended up meeting 96 years later <laughs> in Pittsburgh. Amazing. So um, she, she was steadfast in so many ways. Sadly, at the end of their lives, they had some kind of disagreement um, they separated but did not divorce, as far as I know. Um, and when he died in Chicago, ironically, at a YMCA, um, and then Lev was buried in a pauper's grave, she didn't know it. Um, Sydney didn't know it until later. Um, so it's it kind of sad what happened at the end. I know the family members, the great-grandchildren, for example, they've come to my book talks. I've gotten to know them pretty well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not really clear what happened. Um, it was just a very difficult time for all people involved. And since there's some things we don't know exactly, you know, I don't really speculate. I just know that for whatever reason, um, you know, there, was, there were difficulties at the end. Um, major, it, there was some stubbornness, you know, perhaps on both sides. I don't know. But there was a separation, and there's no question, you know, but that his wife, his daughter, they didn't even know that he had died, sadly, until later. Hi. Um, so speaking Hi. about um, cycling trailblazers, were there any female or women who were trying to break into racing at this time? Yes, they did not compete in the same races that we're talking about here. But the story of women in cycling um, is a story that I do tell in some detail in this book. So let me digress for a second. I'm so glad you asked the question because we didn't talk about this. In 1896, when I mentioned Major Taylor was participating in the six-day race, um, this was a time when there were a lot of women fighting for the right to vote. Um, and there was a particular leader of the women's uh, rights movement, the suffrage movement, who thought cycling was so important that she titled her autobiography, How I Learned to Ride the Bicycle. And the reason she did that was because women weren't allowed in certain places. They were expected to wear these great dresses. And cycling encouraged the development of bloomers, which were, in essence, you know, large versions, billowy versions, of today's pants. Um, and so there was another woman's suffrage leader who said that every time she saw a woman riding a bicycle, it gave her the greatest pleasure. She was so proud because it showed that that woman was independent, wasn't reliant upon a man. So the bicycle was really 
a symbol of freedom for so many people. Um, many of the sports of the day, tennis, for example, um, it, these were sports that started with the elites and came down to the, to the masses. Cycling was a sport that started with the masses, and only later did it come up into the elites, and they realized what a great thing it was. So um, for women, there was, for example, the story of a woman named Annie Londonderry was her last name, was a nickname that wasn't her given name, and she wrote a book about how she cycled around the world. Some people later questioned whether she did the entire route and so forth, but she did cycle a lot of the route around the world. She became internationally known. There were quite a lot of other women, including African-American women, who also had some great sporting achievements. They just weren't having um, the, mist, the mixed athletic you know, uh, events, men and, and women at that time, that Major Taylor was competing in, but he would have known some of these great women cyclists um, and in some ways, when you look back at the coverage, there is women cycling today, but there was a lot. I mean, I found a magazine that was just about, I think it was, I don't remember the name of it, so I'm going to misstate it, but it was about women cycling, how to be a woman cyclist, what kind of clothes to wear, what kind of bicycle to get. It's an incredible, really incredible history. And um, I had not known that story that the suffrage leader had titled her, her autobiography, how, to, how I Learned to Ride the Bicycle, but it just tells you so much, you know, just in that title how much this meant uh, to women, that they were given freedom in some ways, as were African-Americans. You didn't have to go to a separate car to ride in a bicycle if you were black. You could ride a bicycle basically you know, all over. Maybe you were not allowed to go in certain areas, but you know, it was a symbol of freedom, just as it is today you know, for many people. Thanks for asking. Do we have any other questions? Yes. I don't see one out here, and we don't have any questions online but I would like to say thank you so very much. It was outstanding. Can you explain right now, what's the status of cycler racing right now? Do we have any African Americans that are doing it at, or other people of color? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, Justin Williams, um, black racer, was just on the cover of Bicycling Magazine a month or two ago. Um, there are and have been a number of great um, black racers, um, some of whom I've gotten to know. Uh, there, but you know, there's nothing like the representation there should be, for example, in the Tour de France. We don't have the same culture of cycling um, in this country that they have, for example, in France. But one of the great things in doing this book was that I've gotten to meet so many major Taylor cycling clubs. All over the country, there are major Taylor cycling clubs. They wear jerseys with major Taylor's picture on it. Many of my book talks, I'll see club members show up with the Major Taylor jerseys. And even the great racers, the best black racers in the country today, will often say they got their start racing with a Major Taylor group. So um, I think that's growing. It's, it's a rare couple of months that go by that I don't hear about some new Major Taylor group. Um, I got a little emotional talking about the Major Taylor trail, um, blazing my own trail because there's a trail in Chicago um, called the Major Taylor Trail, and, and that motto is on that trail. So it has a double meaning, and I only wish that that would be in every city in the country um, because it really has that great double meaning. It tells his story, and it provides you know, that access to people that maybe they don't have, um, that they should have. So it's not nearly what it should be by any stretch at all, um, and I'm sure if you had a, a prominent black racer here that they would tell you that they faced a lot of racism and unfairness even up to this day because I've heard them say it. So I, I can't do justice to what they would say. Um, but I do see more and more um, prominence to that. I hope I do my incredibly small part in that by telling Major Taylor's story, which I know means so much um, to people who race with his picture um, on their jersey and who continue to be inspired by his story to this day. Thank you so much. Do you, are there any more questions? Okay, we'll take one more right here. Some of the monuments of cycling, like Perry Ribai, do date to the 19th century, single day road races. Did he do any road racing? Did he venture into it? He did a little. Um, he didn't do uh, Perry Ribai, as far as I know. Um, he did, certainly did not do the Tour de France, although it began when he was still cycling. Um, it just wasn't his kind of race. He did have some long distance racing. He typically was not successful in that. He just wasn't his sport, even though he started out doing this crazy six-day race. Um, he mostly kept to the shorter, 
um, track racing, in which he was so incredibly successful. That might mean some races might have been 20, 25 miles, but he didn't do the 75 mile or the century or more than that. He didn't do the multi-day races after, I think he did trying to do one other multi-day race, if I recall correctly, but he really kept to the track racing, which at the time was the great event of the day. Tour de France was just starting as he was in his waning days of his career. So um, the answer is no you know, to, that, to that question, but he did do many of the greatest races of his day, just not the races that we know today as the great races. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for an entertaining and an educational uh, program tonight with a lot of very helpful insights on racial justice. And we want to thank you very much for joining us here at the Dole Institute. Thank you so much. Hello. And could we please give a round of applause for Bill Lacey as the interviewer this evening. Thank you. But I'm not finished yet. <laughs> this is the book. We have them on sale. Michael will sign them for you. Christmas is coming up. You've probably seen all the supply chain problems for <laughs> Christmas gifts. Well, we've got the entire supply, ch supply chain of this book here tonight. So buy as many as you want. He'll sign them. And uh, you'll do, you'll, it'll, it's fascinating. So uh, thank you all for coming out. We appreciate your support. Have a great evening. That was great, Michael. Thank you.